the Denver Center for the Performing Arts Off Center and the Museum of Contemporary Art Denver present Mixed Taste, Tag Team Lectures on Unrelated Topics. And now, introducing tonight's unlikely pairing, Alien Communication and Shoddy Fabric. Please welcome tonight's hosts, Sarah Bai and Charlie Miller. Welcome to Mixed Taste. My name is Charlie Miller. I'm the curator of Off Center here at the Denver Center for the Performing Arts. And I'm Sarah Bai. I'm the director of programming at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Denver. And this is Mixed Taste. We are your hosts this summer. We're mixing it up every week. And for those of you who are here in the ballroom, we have a special cocktail in the back of the room. This one is called the Fabric of the Universe. So. We'll be serving drinks all night. Be sure to get one for yourself. Um, and in order to allow audiences here in the ballroom and those watching from home to participate in the show at the same time, we have a second screen experience. If you're here with us for a, a second or third week, you know how this works. Scan the QR code that you see on the screen, uh, hold your phone over it, tap the pop-up. It takes you to a, a web page where you have three tabs. You can participate in the ideas chat. You can take polls and uh, submit questions for the Q&A. So we're going to have a quick poll to try it out tonight. And you may have already seen it as you came in. This question is, what is the oldest piece of clothing that you currently own that's still in your rotation? You're wearing it all the time. So let's see what, let's see what you said. We've got t-shirts. We've got, we've got jackets, defini sweater, Definitely t-shirt. Uh, definitely t-shirts, bathrobes. And, we were seeing that some of you have even put some underwear in there. I, we're not 100% sure how we feel about that. We've got a few college sweatshirts. Wow, an elementary school sweatshirt. I actually wasn't expecting that. That's even, Very good. That's even a little bit older than we I thought. We've got some 1980. It seems like 1989 is maybe the oldest. All right, really you're getting the, getting the hang of the polls. These are going to be important at our halftime game. Yeah. Uh, so now that you've got a hang of that, we're going to show you how to do the question and answer. And we're going to take you over to the ideas tab. We're going to ask you another question. That is, if you could communicate with aliens, what would you say to them? Let's see what joggers. Oh, stay away. So, oh. hello. Um, so this is the ideas chat. This is where you can participate in a conversation in real time as the show goes on. And then as you have questions tonight, you can put those in the Q&A tab, which is the one we haven't tried, but I think you'll get the hang of it. That's right. Um, all right, so let's get started. Mixed Taste, as many of you know, is a mashup series where we bring together two experts to speak on completely unrelated topics, and then we do a live question and answer session on both topics at the same time. At the same time. time. Our, the rules are very simple. The first speaker speaks on her topic for 20, his topic for 20 minutes. Then the second speaker speaks on her topic for 20 minutes. During the first part of the program, we allow no connections between the topics. But during the Q&A, anything can happen. Anything can happen. We'll take a, a quick halftime in between talks, play a little game that happens to be one of my favorites this week. And a local poet will be joining us to share at the end of the night an original poem inspired by what we all learned here together. So it is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker tonight. Kachun, you will be speaking on alien communication. Kachun is the curator of space science at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. His research interest includes studying how to teach astronomy with digital planetariums and astronomical research involving outflows from protostars and young star clusters. So please give a warm welcome for Kachun Yu. All right, welcome everyone tonight. It's great to see everyone here, um, live and in person and also um, online. So, um, you know, for, uh, for many of you, if you think about the words alien communication, um, what do you think of? Well, it's obviously, I'm trying to talk to um, an extraterrestrial being um, from um, elsewhere outside of our solar system. And, uh, and I think I can speak for the, most of us that, you know, our ideas about that ha hasn't been um, shaped by listening to scientists talk or um, reading the encyclopedia, but it's been shaped by popular media like movies and television. 
And so sometimes um, the, the media does reflect what scientists think. So many of you might be familiar with the movie Contact, um, starring Jodie Foster, where they uh, are involved in searching for extraterrestrial intelligence, or SETI, um, and using um, radio telescopes to do it. But more often than not, it's not this um, distant communication, but it's actually having th those aliens coming and visiting us. And sometimes those vis visitors are very inscrutable and very opaque, and neither the audience nor the characters um, in the movie really understand what their point or their message is. But um, for the most part, um, oftentimes the, um, the alien message is very clear because they obviously look very human. I am leaving soon, and you will forgive me if I speak bluntly. And they speak English, um, <laughs> albeit um, usually English as a second language. <laughs> but um, oftentimes... Latu, Barada, Nikto. Even their alien language um, is in a form that can be enunciated by human actors. And, um, and of course, we have lots of examples of alien languages that have really sophisticated grammar and vocabulary. Uh, but again, for the most part, uh, these are all um, tones and sounds that can be uh, made by human actors. And that's even true, even if the alien doesn't even have a human-like physiology. And now some movies do use nonverbal communication, and um, we are, are all um, familiar with, with those because even those forms of communication are familiar to us. So they can involve music, or they can involve sign language. And then sometimes even whale song. So it's a completely different species. But I don't think we've ever really um, seen an alien form of language that's truly alien until actually just really recently, at least in the movies. And that was um, in just a few years ago um, with the movie Arrival, uh, directed by Denis Villeneuve, uh, based on a short story by Ted Chiang. And the story is basically about aliens that land in spaceships all around the world. And when humans go on board those spaceships, they discover these alien heptapods, and they communicate by spraying out this um, inky um, cloud, which dissipates. And to make it even stranger, the aliens um, don't think in a, not, uh, in a linear sense, but their sense of time is circular, so the past, the present, and the future all wrap around each other. So, you know, that's a, a really, really cool idea. But, you know, going beyond um, what Hollywood thinks, how do scientists think about communicating with extraterrestrials? And this is something that astronomers and other scientists have thought about um, for at least the last 50 years, if not longer. And um, we can go all the way back to the Pioneer 1011 spacecraft, which were launched in 1972. And these were the very first robotic explorers that we've sent out to explore the outer solar system. In this case, they explored Jupiter and Saturn. They were followed by the Voyager 1 and 2 spacecraft, which were launched about a decade later, roughly. And, at, and these were the f first spacecraft that were launching trajectories that would eventually take them out of our solar system and out into interstellar space out in our galaxy. And on the Pioneer 10 and 11 spacecraft on board, um, each of the spacecraft was an alum aluminum gold-plated uh, plaque, and there were drawings on it that were designed by Carl Sagan and Frank Drake. And of course, to us, the, uh, the figures uh, to the right that are naked are the ones that draw our attention, but to an alien species, the key to understanding this message is actually that weird barbell off to the upper left. And presumably, an alien species that can intercept the spacecraft is advanced technologically, has an understanding of science and math. And so Carl Sagan and Frank Drake assumed that um, they would be able to use the language of math and science to convey their message. And so this is supposed to represent the, um, the hydrogen atom. And most of you know that hydrogen is the simplest atom in the universe. It has a proton, an electron, that circles it or orbits it. And on the picture to the right, that's um, a case where you're seeing um, the hydrogen atom with a depiction of what we call the spin 
of uh, the two particles. And so spin is actually a quantum mechanical concept, and it's, um, you can't actually really think of it um, easily in ordinary day terms, but you can think of it like, as, uh, like, like the spin of a top. And so in one case, um, on the right, you have a hydrogen atom where the spins of the two particles are aligned. And so you can think of the, um, the spins of the proton and electron either going counterclockwise or clockwise. And for a hydrogen atom, it, um, in that particular state, it can actually spontaneously, without any action outside external force, um, these spins will actually flip so that one par um, particle now is misaligned or anti-aligned and um, it'll be going um, counterclockwise and the other one will be um, going clockwise. And so that's what the picture on the left is supposed to represent. And that horizontal bar is supposed to re represent that transition. And when that spin flip happens, a photon um, is emitted, and that photon is associated with the radial um, wavelength of 21 centimeters or a frequency of 0.7 nanoseconds. And so for an alien species that's well-versed in math and science, if they can decode the fact that this is supposed to represent the hydrogen um, spin flip, then they might be able to associate that, um, well, the horizontal bar is supposed to represent that transition, and then you have that little uh, vertical uh, bar that's supposed to represent something involving that spin fl flip. So it could mean 21 centimeters or it could mean 0.7 nanoseconds. So now, if you go back to that picture, you notice that there are four um, sort of horizontal and vertical lines to the right of that woman. And if we zoom into that, we, and let's go ahead and turn it on its side, this looks, and the, the, the plaque is filled with horizontal and vertical lines. Those, those are the most common uh, symbols on it. So perhaps that represents a, a binary uh, pattern or binary message. So if we associate um, those lines to 1000, that's binary for the number 8. And if you take the number 8 and multiply it by 21 centimeters, that gives you about 5 foot 6. And so that actually turns out to be the size of that woman on the side there. And you might think, wow, that's quite a uh, leap to take. But um, the aliens, because they have that spacecraft in their possession, they can confirm via the outline of the schematic of that um, spacecraft that you know, it is about, you know, um, it, the spacecraft is slightly larger than five uh, feet, um, six inches. Now, next, I want to, um, I mean, obviously, the solar system is pretty obvious at the bottom. Who knows what the aliens might make of that, um, the arrow? But I want to um, take you to the starburst pattern. And that pattern is supposed to tell the aliens where we are, or where the spacecraft comes from. And again, um, we're using uh, binary information encoded in those lines. And those lines are supposed to represent 14 uh, pulsars that are um, aligned uh, relative um, to our sun. And pulsars are the remains of giant stars that have exploded in supernovae. And uh, most of the star has um, exploded outwards, but uh, part of the core has now collapsed and condensed to a rapidly rotating um, dense core of neutrons. And pulsars or neutron stars emit huge amounts of radio um, waves, so they're very bright in radio. And because they're spinning, they're sort of like cosmic lighthouses. They're very easy to see. And they can spin hundreds of times uh, per second. And they um, also decay over time, so the spin rate isn't um, doesn't stay the same. And so presumably, an alien species looking at their galactic map of pulsars, they can then work out you know, um, what uh, pulsars might correspond to the alignment and, um, and frequencies of uh, pulsars in the past of the species that launched the spacecraft. And now, yeah, this is great, but if you think about it, the Pioneer spacecraft are, are sort of like messages in a bottle where you toss them out into the cosmic ocean hoping that some interstellar voyager will just randomly run into them, which um, seems like kind of a stretch if you think about you know, the fact that these um, spacecraft are maybe slightly larger than a human being. So uh, perhaps a better way is a much more um, directed messaging um, to send a message out to aliens. And this is something that was first done in 1974. Um, at a commissioning ceremony for a, a, um, an instrument on the Arecibo Observatory in Puerto Rico. This is the same radio dish that collapsed last year, unfortunately. But uh, they basically sent a message that was a three-minute burst uh, that was sent out towards M13, a globular cluster. 
And this globular cluster is located about 22,000 light years away. So this message is going to take 22,000 light years to get there. And if there's, there are aliens, any, any one of those 300,000 stars that make up the, the globular cluster, then if they immediately reply, it'll be another 22,000 years before the message gets back to us. So it's a 44,000 year uh, round trip. So you have to you know, be in it for the long haul. <laughs> but here is the message. And uh, it's, um, so the message was frequency or FM, uh, frequency modulated, so basically an FM signal. And it's done in such a way that you can um, think of it again as a binary, um, sort of like a Morse code message. And there are 1,679 um, sort of message uh, bits. And so um, for the mathematicians um, in the room or among the aliens, um, you'll know that 1,679 can only be divided by 73 and 23. So if you lay um, that message out into a 73 by 23 grid, this is what you get. Um, you know, it, looks, it doesn't look random, but it, do, it also doesn't look like a picture. But if you lay it out the other way, a 23 by 73 grid, suddenly a picture pops out. So let's take a look at what um, those um, elements of the picture are about. And the very first row, um, we're going back to the binary um, numbers. And so the very bottom, um, th th those aren't part, part of the binary pattern, but they just represent the start of a number. So they're just placeholders. So you can ignore the very bottom row, but if you look at the other um, digits in the other rows, uh, they basically count from 1 to 10 in binary. And so once you establish that, then let's go on to this um, sort of puzzling um, glyph. And if you, again, assume those are binary numbers, that gives you 1, 6, um, 7, 8, and 15, and then if you, or, or 16. And then um, if you're um, clever, um, you can then associate that with um, uh, the um, atomic numbers of elements. And these elements happen to be um, important for the makeup of our DNA. And then so here, um, again, using that same um, setup, now you're looking at um, the chemicals that make up the DNA. And then now um, we have the double helix of the DNA in blue. And then highlighted in white is the number of nucleotides or base pairs that make it up. So at the time in the 70s, they thought it was about three, uh, 4 billion. Today, after the Human Genome Project, we know it's only about 3 billion. And, um, and then, this is probably the most recognizable part of the picture, you have a human being. And then there, there's a number um, off to the left um, that's supposed to represent um, the number four. And, um, um, and so if you multiply four by the wavelength of the message, that gives you about five foot nine. Um, so that's the height of the human. And then the number off to the right um, is supposed to represent um, the number of people on Earth at the time, uh, so about four billion. And then finally, at the uh, very, uh, oh yeah, and then there's the solar system. You, have, you can see that the third planet is a, a bit off. And, uh, and then finally, the, the bottom is supposed to represent uh, the picture of the radio telescope, the radio dish that sent the message. And then finally, there's supposed to be a number at the bottom that's supposed to tell you how big that radio antenna is. So, you know, there's a lot there, but... Um, <laughs> You can probably um, guess, wow, I mean, that, there, uh, that, there's a lot of interpretation that has to take place for you to be able to get um, to that message. And so other people have thought about, well, um, can, can you have a much more sophisticated sort of message? And in the 1960s, Hans Ferdinthal, uh, a mathematician, actually wrote a book. And you can actually go and Google this and, and read this book yourself, um, and where he um, talked about Linkos, and it's short for um, Lingua Cosmica. So it's his idea of what a, um, a language um, based on mathematics and science um, that you can build, that you can use to communicate between alien species. And again, it uses mathematics and it, um, it basically introduces very simple concepts like counting. And then in, as the message uh, progresses, um, you get into more sophisticated math and then eventually to um, various sciences, chemistry, biology, physics. And then eventually, if you can believe him, you can uh, start discussing really complicated um, abstract topics like human behavior and concepts about life and death. And so, yeah, I definitely encourage you to read it. But, um, <laughs> you know, since uh, the 1960s and 70s, um, in the last 25 years, astronomers have discovered over 4,000 planets around other stars. And this science visualization by Jackie Faherty um, shows the locations of 
um, those discoveries. And they're in strange patterns just because um, those are the directions that our satellites um, have looked to look for these um, planets. But uh, the planets that we know about still represent a volume of space that's um, a tiny fraction of our Milky Way galaxy. So, but now, just in the last 25 years, you know, our knowledge about uh, planets that lie beyond our own solar system has grown really exponentially. And so that has inspired uh, people to perhaps, you know, sending messages to planets um, or to stars that actually have planets. And this was um, the goal of what's known as now the cosmic call messages. And this was devised by two astronomers, Yvonne Dutil and Stéphane Dumas. And um, they were inspired by both the irreceivable message, so the message using um, a picture, and then they're also inspired by the Linkos language, where you can encode really complicated messages. And, um, and what they did was um, over two separate broadcasts, they uh, broadcast to nine different stars, and some of them at the time um, were known to have um, uh, planets that were just discovered in orbit around them. And um, here is um, some of the pictures that they um, sent out. So again, this is um, um, encoded in the same way that you would do the irreceivable message. You have a number of, um, of bits of information. But what they do is they try um, to basically you know, start off, like Linkos, start off with very simple concepts like counting, and then they move on to arithmetic, where you can show um, addition and um, subtraction, multiplication and division. And then they get on to uh, more and more complicated uh, mathematics. And here um, they're showing geometry. Um, you have the Pythagorean theorem on the bottom. And then they also go into describing uh, different um, um, sciences like um, chemistry and the biology of DNA and then eventually physics and cosmology. Here they're talking about the expansion of the universe. And so their hope is that because um, alien species will have, will share the same science and mathematics that we do, that um, they'll be able to see that um, they can use science and mathematics to communicate um, with us, or we can communicate with them. So that brings us to the end and um, has, us, has me asking, well, and, and asking you, you know, what is the future of both the search for extraterrestrial intelligence and messaging ex extraterrestrial intelligence. And here we've kind of, kind of gone through a whirlwind uh, tour of what scientists and astronomers have thought would be the best ways to do this. And they think these are the best ways just because radio communication and communication using other forms of electromagnetic radiation is dirt cheap. And even a primitive species like humans here on Earth can both receive and send and transmit radio waves. And so you would expect that this would be um, the easiest way to do it. You have sig signals traveling at the speed of light. And um, most scientists, I think, um, think physical contact, or um, where you actually have um, travelers come from elsewhere, is unlikely just because of just the amount of energy um, that's required. And so I think you know we can't entirely predict what the actual form of communication will be like if indeed we receive a message from um, stars outside of our own solar system. But I think uh, most astronomers will say that it's probably will be unlikely to be anything similar to what we've seen in Hollywood. All right, so thank you very much. Thank you so much, Kachun. And now it's... It's halftime. Feel free to take a quick break if you need it. Grab a fabric of the universe um, and enjoy. Uh, we're going to play a quick game. So get into Slido with the QR code on the screens. And uh, you, for those of you who tuned in remotely last summer, we invented a game that some found disgusting, I found entertaining. Uh, and we're going to do a live version of it again here tonight. Um, so I am very excited to bring back <laughs> Mixed Taste Literally. Yes. And uh, as, as we do every week, we are going to invite tonight's poet to play along with us. Uh, so please welcome Bianca McCann. Welcome, Bianca. Hi. All right. Mixed Taste in person. 
So here's how this game is going to work. This is Mixed Taste, literally the appetizer edition. And as you all know, every good canapé has a base, a topping, and then a garnish. So Bianca will choose the base that Charlie and I will enjoy tonight. And then you, the audience, will choose the topping and the garnish. And we'll go through the different options that we have with you tonight. So uh, I will just say um, there are some delicious combinations here, and there are some truly <laughs> yeah. abhorrent combinations here. And it's in it's... your hands to determine which we will get. And most of these foods uh, either come from things that Charlie and I already eat. In fact, some of them are from our house or things that we would eat. So let's quickly go through the bases, the toppings, and the garnishes, and then we'll get on with the vote. All right. Uh, so starting here with the bases, we can have Melba toast or Oreos. Perhaps you would enjoy boiled eggs. Or jalapenos. All delicious yeah. in their own way. <laughs> and then for the toppings, we have uh, this... Uh, Goat cheese. Very ripe goat cheese. Very, very Excellent. Ripe goat cheese. Uh, creamy peanut butter. Guacamole. Delicious. And I found this at Whole Foods last night. It is bison baby food with organic oh. kabucha squash and spinach. I just have to say, babies, it's very different for babies than when my babies were babies. They did not have bison. <laughs> and finally, right. the, for the garnish tonight, you can choose baby M&Ms. Very cute. So delicious. Chopped scallions. Well, we have caviar. This is not expensive caviar. This is the cheapest caviar the Whole Foods sells. Nine ninety nine, oh. and uh, roasted crickets that oh, are sea salt and kicker. cracked pepper. Uh -huh. Okay, so sea here's salt. how it's gonna work. No. Sea salt Bianca, and pepper. Bianca, go wrong. We've got some good combinations we've here for got you. Some awesome. Um, you get to choose the bases. Sarah and I are each gonna make. An appetizer. We're doing this. So what base would you Bless like you. for Hi. Sarah to build her canapé upon? Sarah, I hope to build a friendship with you in the future. <laughs> and so I appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs> we're going to go. It's real hard to make it right. Um, Melba toast. All right. Oh. Melba toast very is neutral. always delicious. Thank no. you very much. We've got the Melba toast going. There we go. Yes. And, and for Charlie, what base? Charlie. Ooh. I don't know how you deal with jalapeno. I want to be fair. Um, let's go Oreos. Oreos, okay. okay. Well, that could go. I could get could a, go well for a you. wonderful dessert, or I could you get know, a really go bad that. stomach. Very tragic. I see some options. We'll see. All okay, right. so now it's time for you to vote. First, we're going to choose the topping for Sarah, and your choices again are ripe goat cheese, guacamole, peanut butter, and baby food. So go ahead and put in your votes right now. I know what I want, but I think this, again, this isn't up to me. I oh. encourage you to go in. <laughs> <laughs> that, it's overwhelming, Sarah. That, that is, in fact, what I wanted to... You get to... a nice big squirt of the bison baby food. Thank you very much. I am oh, dying to try this. Overwhelming at overwhelming. over 65%. Bougie babies everywhere are Squeeze super Squeeze it out. Let's take... Oh, it's a... <laughs> <laughs> you know, interestingly, it goes in and comes out the same, looking the same. Who would have thought? You said we weren't going to be gross. Um, All right. I, I should have mentioned <laughs> if, if you are queasy or don't like gross things, yeah, like you might want to tune out for like three more minutes. Get a and then we'll get back universe. to the show. All right. What about for Charlie? What, what, what goes on an Oreo? What goes on an Bianca, Oreo? what would you put on an Oreo? What I would actually put on there? Uh, you know, probably I could see a, a nut butter of some sort, some peanut butter I on an Oreo. I think that would be delicious. I don't feel like that's probably what's going to happen. <laughs> Let's well, see what um, the audience has given me. But we will, that's, we will uh, see. Oh. Ripe goat cheese. Ripe right. goat cheese. Oh, wow. It's not quite All a right. landslide. They, they were, people want to show. Um, <laughs> no, that's just Oreo sauce. So, <laughs> it's going to be like... A nice little stack here. All right. Charlie asked me before the show if I had a, a oh. strong stomach, but I didn't ask you if you had a strong stomach. I we're going to find out. All right. And finally, the topping. Okay, so again, we've got M &M, mini M&Ms, uh, caviar, scallions, or crickets. What is your choice on, for Sarah? <laughs> wow. You didn't make Roasted this crickets election. all the way. I mean, what can you do? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you all a secret. The crickets are mine, so uh, this isn't going to bother me, but I, I, hope that, I hope that you aren't disappointed that I'm going to put 
I'm going to put a couple on yeah, them. Yeah, we, we sampled them before, and they're, they're crunchy. Oh. <laughs> a little salty. If you want crickets of your own, you can get these at the Denver Zoo. Uh, oh. Right yeah. by uh, the Stingray Cove exhibition. So I know you'll all be rushing there tomorrow to pick up your crickets. Uh, they have them in three flavors. And, and, onion, <laughs> <Yes>. and, <laughs> and for you, Charlie, what topping would you, or what garnish would you like for... Oh, I see Sha where this is going. I where bet. is this going, Bianca? I think it's going... Yeah, where else could it go? Cheap caviar. <laughs> <laughs> Should have seen it coming. <laughs> You know, and when advertising this golden whitefish roe, they say it has a sweet flavor and then adds a nice top to your meal. So okay. uh, I think It'll that will... It'll play off of... Wow. I think... You guys See, think that, that you're being either. mean to Charlie, but I think he eats Oreos and caviar for dinner like every <laughs> night. So, uh, all right. Well, it um, actually is kind of, they're not bad looking. No, they're we'll get, I mean, get a, a close up side by side of, yeah. of our two <laughs> treats here before we consume them. I didn't eat dinner tonight so that I would have room <laughs> for the canapes. I must say, I think I got the better end of the deal here, at least you going think? into it. Really? I Bianca, think I got the, would you I got like to make yourself one you to join us? You can make a good one. It can be good, or Listen. you can just pass if you want. Uh, <laughs> There's plenty of snacks here. I might get a little have a toast toast. Toast. and just swipe it in some oh, See, she got the there good one. There we go. Okay, Live well, my dream. cheers, well, everyone. Out. Thank you, audience. Cheers. Here we go. Oh, layers. <laughs> That's got layers. <laughs> How's it, uh? It's good caviar. <laughs> but there's like some tang, some seafood. Wow. Wow. And then it finishes sweet. <laughs> all right. <clears throat> Thank you Wowie. all. Wowee. Thank you for indulging Wowie. us. Wowee. <laughs> Champions. <laughs> Delicious. Thanks, thank you, I'll Bianca. See you all later. Yes. We look forward to your poem later tonight. That is, thank you so much for uh, letting us play along. We have at the back of the room tonight, as we have every week, Tattered Cover. Tattered Cover is here with some very special books that they're bringing as part of their Mixed Taste Summer Reads series. Every week, we're adding new books to the list. And tonight, we have a very special edition because our next speaker, Hannah Rose Shell's books, Shoddy is featured at the back of the room, and she will be staying after the show to sign some books. That is a great segue, Sarah. There we go. Now, on with the show. On with the show. Uh, and now I would like to introduce our speaker who will be presenting on Shoddy Fabric. Hannah, Rose, Hannah Rochelle is associate professor in the Department of Art and Art History and the Department of Cinema Studies at the University of Colorado Boulder. She has published articles on subjects including taxidermy, waste processing, and the history of chronophotography. Her new book, Shoddy, From the Devil's Dust to the Renaissance of Rags, emerges from her fascination with old clothes and the lives they lead. Please welcome Hannah Rose Schell. Well, thank you so much. I'm so thrilled to be here and to be part of this Mixed Taste event. I'm a writer, historian, and image maker, as well as a professor at CU Boulder since 2018. For years and years, I've been fascinated by fabric, lively, vibrant, a kind of skin, a second skin, a textile skin, in various ways the product of nature, technology, and the body coming together. So over the last decade, I've produced two books, as well as related visual projects. The first, about camouflage, was called Hide and Seek. The second, called Shoddy, From Devil's Dust to the Renaissance of Rags, emerges out of a long-standing fascination with old clothes, sustainable materials, and textile recycling. That all started with the film I made called Second Hand, about globalization and the international trade in old clothes. Shoddy. You may well think you know shoddy, an adjective meaning low quality, badly done. But what you think, what you know is just a window, an entry point into hidden worlds of textile intrigue. What does the word shoddy mean? And, <clears throat> and then what is shoddy? And why does shoddy matter? I think shoddy matters deeply. 
So it might not surprise you to know that I follow the word shoddy closely. I've received daily digests documenting the word's usage from Google Alerts for the last six years. So here's a few that came up in the last couple days. Um, these are both typical and emblematic, and I don't mean for you to be able to read those, but just to see, that's about the average number I get for each day. Here's a few. Federal Comptroller of Works decry shoddy road contract. 49 personnel in the government get notice for shoddy attendance. Thank gerrymandering for shoddy infrastructure. And then WHO squanders cash on its shoddy vaccines. So we've got shoddy road contract, shoddy attendance, shoddy infrastructure, and shoddy vaccines of all things. But long, long before shoddy was used in all of these ways, as an adjective, shoddy was a thing, a peculiar and profound entity, practically a living one, or so it's become to me the more time I've spent in the, in the world of shoddy and fabric. The term shoddy came into existence in 1811 as a noun and only a noun to refer to a new textile material produced from old rags and tailor's clippings. Shoddy referred to both the product and the process by means of which used woolen garments and discarded bits were opened in the language of the time, ground in a machine called a rag picker. The shoddy, in its clumpy material form, would then be respun with a bit of new wool inserted, and the result was shoddy fabric, from which would be fashioned new, or rather new-ish, clothes, or used as fertilizer or stuffed into saddles and mattresses. This here is khaki wool produced for British railway workers. The basic process begins with the collection of old clothes, as well as other waste products and leftovers from the new clothing industries. Cash for clothes. And in fact, places like cash for clothes is where most donated clothes also end up, though that's a different story. So old clothes are sorted. Those destined to be shredded rather than resold as is are baled together. And here is one such bale. Then, the teeth of a machine, sometimes called a devil, take action. And then the grinding begins, keeping in mind that grinding takes many forms, for the teeth come in all shapes and all sizes. So where is shoddy now? Today there are still lots of clothes made out of shoddy, including army blankets and jackets. As an example, you can check out here, I've brought this cape secondhand and the first gift I was given by my now husband. And I have to say, I only learned many years later that it's 100% shoddy. <laughs> but it takes many other shapes and forms as well. Heaps of fertilizer, eco-friendly insulation, shipping material, moving blankets, and so on. Mattresses as well. Lots and lots of mattresses. These particular mattresses are made by a company called Dreamers. So where did shoddy come from? Dealing in old clothes and textile waste goes way back. As long as there have been clothes, which is a really long time, um, there have been old clothes, and they have moved between bodies and between markets. And there's a long history of itinerant rag peddlers across cultures that have familiar songs and refrains. Buying and bartering in old clothes continued with industrialization generally and the mass production of goods, including clothing, in the 19th century. It was only then that shoddy emerged. The devil emerged in the form of this machine, the devil. Officially called a rag picker, the name devil quickly took off. The shoddy industry that emerged on the periphery of the new textile industry was dusty, and people started talking about it in terms of what they called devil's dust. The industry started in England, but soon it moved to the United States. <clears throat> Recycled, collected, and sorted textile waste, as well as so-called clippings from the new wool factories, were turned into plentiful new, or new-ish, raw materials in shoddy factories, which sprang up in what sometimes called themselves shoddy towns in the north of England. 
Now, it's important to emphasize here that there's nothing necessarily low quality or shoddy about shoddy. When the word came into existence, all it meant was this stuff. And in my opinion, these shoddy samples are simply luminous. The colors, the textures are gorgeous. There are different kinds of shoddy. Some of these go by other names, but I consider them all to be members of the larger shoddy family. Sometimes these designations are made based on the length of the fibers. Shoddy, including mungo and extract, became widely used in the production of suits, army uniforms, slaves' clothing in the 19th century, carpet lining, and mattress stuffing. Shoddy itself, as well as the waste from making shoddy, ended up on fields as fertilizer due to the very high nitrogen content in wool. So I really do believe that there's something inherently profound, vibrant, liminal about shoddy. Here it is slowly decomposing into the earth. And listen to this from 1830, composed by a certain Mr. George Head. He commented, the trade or occupation of the late owner, his life and habits, or the filth and antiquity of the garment itself oppose no bar to this wonderful regeneration. Whether from the scarecrow or the gibbet, it makes no difference. So that according to the change of human affairs, it no doubt frequently does happen, without figure of speech or metaphor, that the identical garment today exposed to the sun and rain of a ch Kentish cherry orchard or saturated with tobacco smoke on the back of a beggar in a pothouse is doomed in its turn to grace the swelling collar or at a dignified proportion to the chest of a dandy. So here's the bigger picture. A giant heap of, of shoddy by the highway at the periphery of a rhubarb field in England showing all different types of shoddy, wool waste, shoddy flock, devil's dust. And I have to admit that I've, I've spent time looking at these images of shoddy heaps, and I, I swear I see the Matterhorn, you know, these kind of larger mountain, mountain landscapes. So now that we know what shoddy is, I want to just move on to how it became shoddy. How did shoddy become shoddy? How did that adjective come to be? I already mentioned devil's dust. By the 1840s, political activists, eventually even including Karl Marx, began to use shoddy manufacturing, shoddy the material, the dust left over from shoddy, the people working in shoddy, as well as work involving old rags in general as an example of the worst of the worst in terms of the exploitation of workers. So devil's dust became a political rallying cry in England in the 1830s and 1840s. But the real way that shoddy became shoddy, as opposed to just devil's dust, happened in the United States in the period around the American Civil War. Earlier I mentioned slaves' clothing and army uniforms, both made of shoddy. On the Union side, or in the North during the Civil War, the U.S. government hired multiple textile manufacturing companies, mostly from New England, to produce huge quantities of coats, blankets, even American flags out of shoddy materials. Now these companies, notably, were also the very ones who had, until just months before the war started, been selling their shoddy woolen fabric to southern plantation owners to make clothing for the slaves. So there's a lot of intensity here. Um, and one, can, one gets the sense that fabric is very thick with meaning um, in all sorts of ways. So the quality produced for the government ended up being awful. It was terrible. And here you can see this is a shoddy blanket. Um, actually, it's very hard to find a shoddy blanket these days from the Civil War because they tended to fall apart. But um, I tracked one down in northern Maine. Uh, the supply of uniforms quickly became an enormous scandal. For the shoddy uniforms were... were across the board of tremendously low quality, and were said to immediately break down into dust, to melt in the rain, to fall to pieces. And it was seen by all as a kind of travesty, as sort of treasonous or traitorous. And so shoddy became shoddy, and shoddy became the, the subject of countless political cartoons, satires, Civil War poems, songs. This is the frontispiece, which I love, of an 1864 novel with the title Days of Shoddy, a romance of the Great Rebellion. 
um, as the subtitle is, which incidentally I've taken as the name of my Instagram feed. <laughs> so the association between low quality uniforms on the one hand and the so-called harvest of death of Union soldiers, the kind of like mass violence and the mass injury that happened to, to soldiers, um, created intense animosity. Uh, so this is a famous, uh, a famous Civil War image of, uh, <clears throat> of the battlefield and of the kind of bodies strewn afterwards. The proximity of clothes to bodies and life to death rendered it so. And here you can see the rotting uniforms there for all to see, um, the shoddy uniforms. So hence the army contractor emerged as shoddy par excellence. He became Mr. Shoddy as shown here in an illustration to a poem that was published in Vanity Fair in 1861. Stories started to talk about Mr. and Mrs. Shoddy and shoddy princesses referred to the nouveau riche. <clears throat> this song presents a cast of characters named Shoddy, all of whom are deeply suspect. As it begins, in times like these, the nation sees dear friends and not a few who deal in rags and coffee bags dressed out and dyed in glue. The patriots strive to keep alive the war from Gulf to Maine. They don't propose this strife to close while shoddy's on the brain. So though the word shoddy began acquiring its contemporary meaning, this kind of um, low quality, uh, derogatory context in the 1860s, the word's use by the industry as a whole continued. So shoddy remained also this thing called shoddy. Um, and the industry grew, influxes of immigrants that came in the late 19th century often ended up working in the rag and the shoddy industries. Um, and this continued until the period after the next big war, after World War I. And it so happens that in the early years of the 20th century, <clears throat> shoddy kind of took a different turn. The very existence of the labels on all of the clothes we wear now are connected to shoddy. For in the early 20th century, right after World War I, the wool industry decided sort of all of a sudden to create the idea of virginity and of virgin wool, which emerged only as a way to counter the kind of continuing strength of the shoddy industry. And there began to, again, be all this kind of propaganda and kind of public, public activity and discussion surrounding shoddy, um, casting it in these like very dramatic, um, dramatic ways. So as in here, the practice of selling shoddy in fabric and clothes without letting its presence be known is a moral blight and an economic evil that threatens all of our institutions. So that's really big, right? It's like shoddy, shoddy is having an impact there. And here, again, we can see materials from a campaign that was presented during US congressional hearings in 1923 and 1924. <clears throat> so these are some ideas about how one might put on a little exhibit you know, in your town hall to try to convince everybody that shoddy A is bad and B needs to be labeled as such. So such textile intrigue indeed and so it's directly from shoddy escapades such as these that we've ended up today living in a world of labels such as virgin wool or even those do not remove upon penalty of lot tags on your mattresses and so forth, which are, you know, endlessly mysterious, but shoddy has, pr provides a kind of great, great answer. So I can't resist, as I start to close up, returning back to the heap of shoddy that I showed earlier. In all of its glory, in its phases of de- and recomposition, for me, a beautiful and magical place that I admit to sometimes dreaming about. <laughs> so when I look closely at shoddy, in shoddy, one can see a whole world. And I begin to see a portal into an inside-out version of our own a kind of shoddy universe, I guess. Sometimes though, from the perspective of the rhubarb farmers at least, if not from my own, enough is enough. Nonetheless, shoddy for me is intimately connected to old clothes, which I love, to all of our bodies, to sustainable fabric and fashion, to human rights, and to the history and future of industrial recycling.
So I want to encourage you, if you're interested, to please reach out. And I'm on Instagram and have a feed called Days of Shoddy, as I mentioned. Um, and I share lots of new shoddy wisdom, which uh, I'm, always, I'm always gathering from the world. Um, I also mentioned a film that I made on the topic that kind of started my shoddy journey. Uh, it's called Secondhand Pepe. Um, and I also just wanted to say thank you. Thank you to all of you. Um, it's been great. All right, now we're going to get started with the Q&A. It is the time of the night where you type your questions into your second device under the Q&A tab. And very important, remember to include your name if you want to be eligible to win tonight's prize for the best connection between the topics. Uh, we'll put the QR code up again if you need it. Uh, we're going to bring up our speakers and get started. We will take questions on both topics at the same time, and we encourage you to try and make connections between alien communications and shoddy fabric if you're able. And uh, as you may know, we give a very special prize to the person who asks the question that makes the best connection. So let's get started. Oh, I forgot to mention, if we make a connection, we will gong the gong. Very important. Yes, very important. All right, uh, we're going to get started with um, an easy one from Anonymous tonight. I don't know, maybe this isn't as easy as, as I'm thinking. Not trying to be clever, but have these forms of communication that you proposed been tried in other species that are already on Earth, like octopi, maybe? Hmm, well, um, I mean, the forms of communication that we saw um, are all assuming that um, these are advanced alien species um, that kind of share uh, the same math and science that we do. And so um, they would have also built radio telescopes. Um, so, you know, there's an assumption that um, you're um, at the same or similar um, technological level and similar types of technology. So, um, and I'm, I'm not a biologist, so I don't know um, what the biologists are doing as far as um, communicating with octopi and whales and other species, unfortunately. Um, here's a, a great question from Colin. Shadi changed meaning over a short period of time. What are the chances of our messages to aliens not changing or being misinterpreted considering the delay? Great crossover. There you go. Not sure I can answer that. <laughs> I think that's over to you. Yeah, yeah, it is. Um, yeah, I mean, um, there, there's, you know, um, I think people wonder, you know, is math really a, a universal language? And um, and I think um, if you talk to the mathematicians, um, they would say that math is even more universal than anything else. And so again, if you assume that. Um, if you know, other alien species follow the same sort of technological developments that we have, meaning you know, ha having a, a very um, technology-focused um, type of civilization, then um, you, um, they, they would find um, meaning in the messages that we send them. But if, um, I guess if, and again, you know, this is pure speculation on my part, since um, I'm not necessarily involved in this research, but if um, these aliens um, or much more inward looking, you know, they don't um, care about um, technology the same way or building um, radio telescopes and perhaps, you know, they pick up the radio signals, but um, they're, they're picking it up as part of something else they're doing, then, you know, perhaps it might not have the same impact. That's, so we have a question from Bob. This one also brings together uh, a connection. Well, we'll see, I suppose. Uh, which shoddy fabric and stitching style would be best to portray complex arrangements of binary to communicate our existence in the cosmos? Yes, that is so right on. That is like the question. So I was actually just thinking um, with your response to the last answer, I began really thinking about this idea of like, you were talking about math, and is math really like such a universal language? But what if you could grind the math up? 
You know what I mean? Like if you had a way to grind the math up and then you could kind of transport it to the aliens and then they would be able to take it and like reweave it, you know what I mean, with a little bit of their language, a little bit of the new language from them, and then they could put it together. I mean, that's you know? how I felt already about it. Yeah. Brilliant. I'd have to really think about that. <laughs> that's a good answer then, yeah. All right, so we got it. Problem yeah, yeah, solved. It. Done. Oh. Um, TJ uh, asks if aliens wear white after Labor Day. Well, that assumes uh, they have Labor Day. And, um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I'm getting stumped by all these questions. Yeah, we got some good questions here. Uh, we'll, we'll ask the, the next one that rose to the top from Dillinger. Are our messages sent out in the universe? Are our messages sent out in the universe just a shoddy in the dark? Oh. <laughs> Actually, it, um, they might be because you know we, we've seen these examples of intentional messages, but what about all the messages that are just you know waste products? You know things that we don't think of. Like, um, I mean, and th those of you who've seen, you know, um, Contact, I mean, you know that, that the beginning, beginning of the film starts out with um, all of the radio leakage um, and the fact that, you know, the very first message that the aliens receive was a, a TV broadcast of Hitler at the 1936 Olympics. And so um, the Earth is constantly leaking out radio information. Um, and so in some ways, you know, uh, perhaps, you know, the, the shoddy part, part of um, our electromagnetic presence will be um, made um, known to alien species long before the uh, the virgin wool, you know, versions of that. Okay, I just want to. I just have to. I just have to. Just have to nail down here again. What is just a shoddy in the dark? What is just a shoddy? We have to think again about these two meanings of shoddy, right? <laughs> so just a shoddy makes it sound like there's something not so great about it. But like just a shoddy. Like, maybe it's this really high-quality shoddy in the dark. It's like high-quality cashmere shoddy. It's like the best shot you could have. So I just want to make sure that's clear. Well, it's like going to the Cherry Creek Goodwill. You know, that's where you get all the really good stuff. Being that the shoddy does have two meanings, I feel a little bad asking this next question. But being that their SIBO telescope fell apart, would you call the construction shoddy? <laughs> This question is from Ross. Yeah, I mean, uh, um, I haven't read any reports about um, why um, they think it fell apart, and I'm not sure if the reports have been made. But yeah, I mean, yeah, you, you, um, you have this large structure that's built in a tropical environment where it rains a lot, you know, um, and there's just a lot of um, stresses on it. And so, um, you know, is there a connection to what happens to clothing in um, harsh environments? Yeah, I mean, I would say definitely a quality, con quality control issue on the... Uh... <laughs> but it has lasted for many decades, and so... But now it's lasted even longer as, like, a meme, right? Like, there's that video clip of it falling down, yeah. you know? So that might be its true legacy. <laughs> I hope not, but... <laughs> I think the true legacy is, you know, that message you know, that's being beamed out into 22,000 light years, but we'll see. <laughs> tomato, tomato. <laughs> Oh, there's some great wit going on on the, the questions here. Anonymous said, so, S-E-W, are aliens just nitwits, K-N-I-T? Well done with the puns, thank you. Um, here's, a, here's an interesting question from Sean. Do any consistent mathematical patterns emerge in the making of shoddy? Mm. Well, I mean, I guess there are mathematical patterns that go into any weave in any fabric, right? So. so one of the things that I think is so fascinating about shoddy is that it's like, unlike some other kinds of fabric, shoddy, the way shoddy ends up looking is so dependent on like what it's made, made from, like what the waste is that comes in and then what happens when it's shredded, shredded down. So there's much less like consistency. I mean, in a way, less quality control than in like a new wool kind of, kind of industry where you'd have like very specific kinds of weaves. Um, like shoddy makers are constantly having to kind of like compare what they've gotten. What have they gotten? What's come in? They, blend, they, they grind it. How can they make that look enough like whatever the color is or the shape is or the fiber is that's being asked for? 
Um, so they're constantly trying to like finesse their blend. No, yeah, that makes sense. Somebody, Abby actually asks, does she own shoddy clothes and not even know it? Maybe a bit like your cape that you showed earlier. Oh, does the, does the, um, does, does she own? Yeah, she wants to know, like, is there shoddy in her closet? Is there shoddy in my closet? Can I think there probably is. Right I mean, shoddy's been really interesting. Shoddy, although it's like the word hasn't come back quite yet, although in my world of textile people, they're starting to use the word shoddy. There is like a lot of this kind of like renaissance regenerated wool. Eileen Fisher is really into it right now. Um, there is this kind of like marketing branding move that a lot of like big fashion companies are, are kind of making where they're like highlighting the existence of reprocessed materials in their goods. Um, but I'd say, you know, like in a way, something like Patagonia, fleece is all, it, it's, it's ground up um, plastic bottles, but it's like a form of shoddy. I bet, there's, I bet there's some shoddy somewhere in your, wherever you are, somewhere in your wardrobe. Yeah, the answer, Abby, is yes. <laughs> uh, here's a question from Patricia Plays for Fun who won in week one, which is why she's just playing for fun now. Uh, but she has great questions. Do far off planets have the materials to make fabric? And if so, what would aliens make their clothes of? Or would they wear clothes? Well, I guess that uh, presupposes that um, aliens um, have um, a similar ecosystem of you know, um, having fiber, fibrous materials, and that they might um, have a need for clothing. I mean, there are plenty of, of animals here on Earth. I mean, most creatures don't have a need for clothing. Um, I think humans are the only ones, you know, despite the fact that people will put um, sweaters on their dogs. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so, yeah, I mean, the question is, um, um, and, and, then, and I guess you know, part of the reason that why we have clothing is humans have kind of spread out all over the Earth, and we now live in places where you know, it used to be if you didn't have um, the proper clothing, um, it wouldn't be possible for you to live there. So, so I guess, you know, do those alien species have the same sort of drives that we have that would lead them to invest in, you know, um, clothing and um, couture, things like that? I think that if aliens did have clothing or if aliens do have clothing, they'll be a lot easier to communicate with. You know what I mean? Because we'll have something to talk with them about. <laughs> So maybe, you know, maybe we shouldn't have sent the pioneer plaque with those naked figures. <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness. Uh, this question comes in from Anonymous. It is not a crossover question, but they want, like to know, is there any doubt among scientists that intelligent extraterrestrial life exists? Well, um, if you talk to scientists, I mean, until you actually have evidence, you can't really um, say for sure. So um, I, I think um, most scientists will um, say that um, they think the chances of life um, existing elsewhere in the universe um, is pretty solid, and that's just because, at least based on the record of life here on Earth, um, life started um, pretty quickly um, soon after um, the conditions on Earth made it possible for life to exist. And we um, have also discovered over the last several decades that those conditions are also found, or seem to be pretty common um, in our solar system, and in, um, we also have found um, many types of life here on Earth that thrive in um, extreme conditions that we didn't think could survive in before. So um, most, I think, astronomers and planetary scientists and people who think about space will say that life is probably common. And then, um, it, you know, as far as whether um, intelligent life exists, that's where um, it becomes a lot more uncertain because uh, people just don't quite know, you know, whether the path that allowed humans um, and intelligent um, species to ri um, arise on the Earth um, how common th um, that is, um, because we only have one example. I I'll just give a plug for a book called Sapiens that I'm reading right now. It's part of the Mixed Taste Reads Summer Reading List uh, that's on sale with the Tattered Cover. I don't think they have it here tonight, but they will have it on the, at the last night here. Uh, and it, it kind of uncovers some of these same questions. Very interesting. All right, last question of the night. Oh, it just disappeared. Where was it? It was so good. From Ella, politics change the meaning of shoddy. How do we stop politics from making our messages to other worlds shoddy? Ooh. <laughs> 
one thing I'll say is that luckily, I mean, so far, I don't think the politicians have been involved with <laughs> messaging the extraterrestrial <laughs> intelligence. <laughs> so, so that's one, one plus so far. <laughs> I think another way is to maybe like keep it close to the body. You know, if we kind of all just focus, just trying to think about how, how maybe we could like use, just like staying close to each other, kind of keeping our efforts at communicating to the, to the, to the aliens kind of personal, one-to-one. -one. Um, you know, keep, if it's your, just keep your old shirt. Don't, don't like trade it around, no political clothing or anything. Just keep your own, your own piece of clothing and just wear that and focus on the aliens. <laughs> and, and there you have it. All right. Well, thank you very much, Hannah. Thank you very much, Katoon. And now it is prize time. Every week, as you know, as we told you, we give a prize to the person who makes the best connection between the two topics. Those connections are chosen by MCA Denver's very own digital producer, Cheyenne Michael. She's up in the booth reading the questions furiously, choosing her favorites, and the person who submitted the best question tonight will win... Two tickets to Wildfire, a new theatrical concert inspired by real Colorado stories from last year's East Troublesome Fire. This is a brand new show by a Colorado playwright featuring music from some of our favorite local folk musicians. Uh, it's going to tour around outdoor venues, opening at Levitt Pavilion on August 16th, and you will win two tickets to that production. That sounds great. Tell me more about that production. Uh, well, it's going to be great. They just started rehearsals. It's our first live show since COVID, so it's very exciting. Um, some great local, uh, local musicians have contributed songs. It's performed by an eight-person cast who's telling the stories of the um, survivors of this fire and singing the songs. It will be a very moving night about the resilience of community. So who won the prize, Sarah? Well, we are still waiting for uh, the oh, prize winner, prize winner to, to come in. Oh, here it is. It's oh, in the text. We've got it here. Uh, the winning question is from Bob, who asks tonight, which shoddy fabric and stitching style would best portray complex arrangements of binary to communication to communicate our existence in the cosmos? That was a good question. Congratulations, Bob. Very are you here Bob. tonight? Uh, Bob, are you playing along? Great. Thing? Um, Yay, I'll meet you after the show and get your information. Congratulations. Great question. And now let's invite Bianca back to enlighten us with an original poem that is inspired by tonight's talks. Bianca McCann is an MC. She is a poet, a digital composer, a cultural activist, and an educator. Please welcome Bianca McCann. <laughs> Let's see how it went here. Human communication is perhaps the shoddy language of the universe, realigned and mixed about the history and future of industrial recycling. 1,679 messages attempting to comprehend which thread of fabric weaves us through this cosmos. Confirm, dear out there, speak back. Acknowledge our decaying finery. Everything is shoddy. Amplifying virgin wool colonized myths spinning a world consciousness back into consumption. We can't conceive of communication we've not yet engaged in. And it's Rarely the material, rather the spaces and levels of connection the wearer achieves. The proximity to devil's teeth. Two beings, excuse me, the shortest distance between two beings must be math. Measurement. The humble hand weaving a garment fit for ascension. We are thunderclap chasing entropy. Extending toddler palm, endless invitation on radio signal, dear aliens, hear our call, please come. And when you do, please take with you some of this shoddy. <laughs> Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you, Bianca. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you to our presenting sponsor, Blue Room. Blue Room is a private investment company born of invention, forward thought, and hope. Through best-in-class investing, they create space to amplify the power of human togetherism. Togetherism means together we can accomplish anything. And thank you to Kachun and to Hana, and thanks to you, our audience, for joining us tonight and our virtual audience joining us for home, from home. Please take a moment to fill out a survey that comes on your second device that really helps us out. Hana will be signing books with the tattered cover in the back of the room after the show tonight, so please stick around if you'd like to read her fascinating book about Shadi and learn more. And you can join us back next week, same time, same place, for Forest Health and Lowriders. Good night. Thank you, everyone.